Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend. Today we're going to be talking about elevating your e-learning design and this webinar will be recorded so if you would like a copy of this we will send it to you following uh, the live presentation. Today we're really excited to have Misty Harding, one of our custom instructional designers and program managers with us today. Misty, would you like to say hi? Hello. We're really glad to have you with us. Thank you so much for, for taking the time for this webinar. Um, during the webinar, if you have any questions today, uh, feel free to use that questions panel, and we'll try to get back to you in that questions panel, or if, if we have time, we'll bring those up to Misty for her to answer. Um, we'll get to as many of them as we can. If we can't, I, I apologize. We might have some time to get uh, to those in the webinar recap that we post next week. Um, also, at some point, we're going to be uh, collaborating a little bit on a project and getting some ideas together. So use that questions panel to uh, to express your ideas. So without for any further ado, Misty, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm glad you're here, and I'm assuming that you're here for this reason. <laughs> Uh, most e-learning designers, and for that matter, most learners, are stuck in what I call e-learning hell. And I'm sure you have felt the flames of this. Uh, the flames feel like never-ending, click next to continue online PowerPoints. They have terrible clip art and leave you feeling no better off than when you launched them. Learners hate taking them, and as designers, we hate designing them. And all of us want to get to somewhere better. And that place is an e-learning heaven. And I think e-learning heaven looks a little different for all of us. Um, but on the whole, it's a place where cognitive and emotional engagement is taking place, where people get their hands dirty and really get involved with what they're learning, and that we're engaging them on multiple levels. They're getting hands-on practice. They're truly learning and hopefully even having some fun in the process. So the good news is this place exists, but the learner can't change it. We have to be the ones to change it because we are the designers, and so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we, want, we want to find a way to set ourselves apart. So from a career management perspective, it is so difficult to find designers who can truly design an online experience. And so as a designer, as you're managing your own career, part of what you want to get to is how can I do this in a way that sets me apart from other people? Um, my design needs to be the kind that catches attention, that looks impressive, that encourages participation, that leaves a lasting impact, and most of all, and most importantly, is instructionally effective. Designers who can do that are incredibly hard to find. And the problem is that most of us don't know how to do it because all we've ever seen are boring e-learning courses. What are we modeling ourselves after? All we can do is, is what we've seen. And so what I want to talk about today is a way to break out of online PowerPoint mode. How do you get to a better place where your courses are thoughtfully planned, conceptually approved by your stakeholders, and designed for experience and engagement, not just transferred um, to an online learning format from something like a PowerPoint? So to understand how we get there, I want you to picture something. We're going to talk about food. <laughs> Because part of this starts as changing how you think of yourself as a designer. So thinking about food, um, I think it's fair to say that we all, on a semi-regular basis, pay for other people to cook food that we are perfectly capable of cooking ourselves. Um, and, we, but, and we do this for a reason, which I'll get to in a minute. But I want you to imagine um, that we've all just gone to a very highly rated fancy Italian restaurant and we've ordered lasagna. And what comes to our table looks something like this. Technically, we've received everything we've paid for. All the components of lasagna are here. We have the sauce, we have the noodles, we have the cheese. But why isn't it what we expected? It's because the components were not assembled in a way that created the end result you wanted to experience. Somebody took the components or contents of lasagna, the meat sauce and the noodles and the cheese, and they plopped them on your plate. You could have done that at home. So from a value perspective, um, you think, well, hey, I'm paying a chef to make lasagna because I feel, and this is why I eat out, I feel that this person can do it better than me, and that's what I'm paying them to do. 
I want them to assemble these components in a way that creates an end result and an experience that's better than what I could have done on my own. And that's the value that I'm expecting when I go to a restaurant. So how does this apply to design? Um, many designers take content from one place and plop it in another. More like a lunch lady and less like a chef. So that's why e-learning looks like PowerPoint so often. A lot of times our source content is coming from PowerPoint or a Word doc. It's kind of all text. And a lot of us have had to learn the hard way and on our own how to build online learning. And so we're taking it from one place and we're putting it in another and we're just not sure what the difference is between someone who was giving a PowerPoint presentation and now how we want to create an experience online. And because we don't know what that looks like, we kind of just lunch lady plop content from one place to another. In fact, um, really what keeps us in business is that PowerPoint doesn't export to a SCORM conformant format so that people can load it to an LMS. I mean, that's the only reason we're using Storyline or Captivate because you know we can't do it with PowerPoint. But online learning can be so much more than that. And that's not what people are paying us for. It's not what they want. They don't want a lunch lady. They don't want us to just plop it on there. They want a chef. And that's what we want to be. I mean, we feel like we have that value and we want to offer it. And unfortunately, sometimes we just don't know how to get there. Um, so to do that, we have to start thinking about design in terms of experience, not as content and not as components of a course, like click and reveal or drag and drop. We've got to let go of thinking of design that way and see our role differently and see ourselves as someone who's trying to create an experience versus an interaction. So I'm going to give you a preview of what we're talking about today. Today, I'm going to describe to you a blueprinting process that you can use to thoughtfully design and get conceptual approval for a well laid out course before you ever start. This is so key. It's the difference between just throwing stuff in the pan and having a recipe. So we're going to talk today about how do you, how do you get your recipe. Um, I'm going to show you a couple different examples of what that blueprinting process looks like. So you have a couple different things that you can choose from. Um, I'm also going to show you a conceptual framework that I use to take content, or even instructor-led material and properly convert it to an online experience. And we're going to go through several examples of this together. And this is where I'm going to want your input and some brainstorming through the questions panel, because we're going to solve a couple of these together so that you can see how the whole process works. I'm also going to include some real examples um, through this workshopping process of what those solutions might look like. And then we're going to round out each section with some tips for engaging ways that you can open, that you can create activities, et cetera. So we'll go through all of that. And then I'm also going to show you a few real world examples from courses we've designed that incorporate some of the tips we're going to talk about. I do have a few handouts for you that we'll make available as we go through. I want you guys to leave today with a template for how to blueprint. Um, also, any of my slides that are really texty, like with the tips or the steps, I've put those in a handout. So don't worry about having to try to scribble those down. Those will be there. Um, we'll stop at the end of each major section so that I can answer your questions, um, and also I'll stop when we're brainstorming for ideas. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off with blueprinting. Um, and Andrew, if you would launch a poll, I just wanted to quickly ask you guys and get a sense for where we're at in the room, how many of you uh, are slide-by-slide -slide designers? And what I mean by that is you sit down to build e-learning, and you just kind of, um, okay, well, how do I want to start? All right, I'll totally build that out. And what do I want to say next? Okay, I'll totally build that out. Um, or are you somebody who always has a really well thought out plan before you build? Or are you maybe somewhere in the middle? So, Misty, a lot of people have already voted. We've got about 75% of people voting already, and it looks like we're going to have a strong lead. Um, more than half of people here are saying that they're somewhere in the middle. Um, we've got quite a few uh, well-thought-out planners and a few slide-by-sliders, um, but quite a few people are somewhere in the middle. It looks like we've, we've maxed out here. I'll go ahead, and if you want to vote and you haven't voted, I'll give you five more seconds. Four, three, last chance, two, one, and let's look at those results. Okay. So, yeah, somewhere a good, middle, solid good. amount. Yeah, that's great. So still some people designing, but you'll notice only 20, you know, only 20% are saying, yeah, I really know what I'm doing before I do it. 
And that's the concept we're trying to get to today. That's really hard because a lot of times people are push or they're pressuring you. Hey, can you have this done in two weeks? We need to have this launched. And so you're, you're under a lot of pressure. And so you feel like, gosh, the only thing I can do is just build. I've just got to build immediately. Um, but blueprinting doesn't take that long. And in fact, I have always found it saves me in the building process for numerous reasons. And we'll talk about that uh, as I talk about the steps that are involved. So the concept of blueprinting is exactly what it sounds like. It's the same that an architect would do with a house. An architect would not go build a bathroom in the middle of a field and fully decorate it and then ask himself, okay, what should be attached to the bathroom? He just wouldn't do that. So he would map it all out first and then make sure that everything was well proportioned, that the right spaces had the right amount of room. Um, and from even a construction and investment perspective, which pieces of this home deserve more attention than others? Do we want granite countertops? Can we get away with Formica? Do we want a nicer floor? Do we want a master bathroom? Um, those decisions are made before you ever start to build. And the same principle is true for our courses. Um, the blueprint is a game changer because it helps us combat our urge to do a lunch lady plop. It also helps us to avoid situations where we build something that our clients or stakeholders are not happy with and then end up having to rebuild. But also from an instructional design perspective, it allows us to have some accountability and double check of our own work to make sure that we're putting the right investment in the right place. Um, that we haven't designed a 90 minute course for something that should have been 60. When this planning stage is skipped, you end up with whatever you've built piece by piece in the middle of that field. You could run out of budget, you could run out of time, and a blueprint solves all of that for you. So the process that I suggest includes four steps before you ever start to build anything. And we're gonna talk about each one of these. Each one of the slides I'm about to go through is included in your handout, by the way. So I'm just going to describe each of these steps briefly because I want to have time to get to the fun part, which is the design. But we have to responsibly <laughs> go through this part first um, before we just start creatively designing. But this will set you up for an elevated course. And then next, we'll start talking about how to design elevated interactions. So the first step is to gather. You want to get everything in a single place. Review your content as a whole and focus in on what are the true objectives or outcomes. What length are you shooting for? Do you need some initial trimming before you even start? Does some of this stuff need to go? Uh, with those basic parameters, you can get input from the SME or from your stakeholder as to what they think the most and least important objectives of the course really are. Do they want granite countertops or can we save money in that place? You can start to have those conversations when you're looking at the same document, the same material and asking those questions. Then for each of those objectives, you can seek to understand what the impact of great performance is, and then also what happens when performance misses the mark. You want to have a really clear picture of both. What are the common misunderstandings and mistakes that are associated with each one of those, those key objectives? Really dive in and find, find out what it means to the organization. And by this point, you're better equipped to get rid of the superfluous content, and that's the take out the trash bullet. People can only remember so much. So the more garbage that you put in there, it's harder for the learner to sift and understand what's important and what to take away. So we really want to get rid of a lot of that so that we can help them focus in on what really matters. Uh, once you've done that basic prep work, then um, you're going to want to document what you've talked about. This document, which would include an executive summary of the desired course experience for the learner, it would also include what you've uncovered as far as objectives and outcomes. Um, it would also include effective goals. This is something that doesn't get addressed a lot in our field, but so often your stakeholders are really looking for you to help someone feel something. So that's what an affective goal is. How are they supposed to feel? What attitudes are we trying to change? Um, we don't often recognize enough that people are holding us responsible for, for creating a feeling or changing a motivation. So what are those things? What do they expect? And then you can go in and outline the content and sequence, the basic content and sequence of the course. This basic document is something that you can, it can be a deliverable to your stakeholder um, or to your client just to say, hey, are we on the same page? This is what we talked about. This is what I'm going to be focusing on. This is what's included and not included and, and, and just be a basic check. But it's also great for you to come back to because sometimes, like mad scientists, we get really into our design 
and <clears throat> we start to overinvest in areas that weren't really part of the original intention. Um, so this document is something that you can come back to. This is the most important part because this is the design phase is where you're actually going to blueprint. So you're going to go back to the same document and you're going to go back to your outline. And you're going to start to ask yourself the hard questions that usually we don't before we design slide by slide. So you're asking yourself, okay, for what's covered here, what are the key messages? What's the narrative? Um, what are we trying to get across? And once you're zeroed in on that, you're going to create a specific instructional method that you want to use to help the learner experience the message or experience the learning. And you want to get down to kind of the nitty gritty of how you intend to do that. It's not click and reveal. Um, that's not it. And, we'll, and we're going to go through specific examples here in a minute of what it should look like. But you've got to push yourself to really talk about what type of experience you're going to create, what's the learner going to decide, what journey are they going to go through? What type of feedback are they going to get? What are they trying to decide between? What resources do they have for that? You're documenting all of that here. And that plan is what sets a blueprint apart from an outline. It is the difference maker for designers because you're doing the pre-thought before you ever start. And then you can come back at the end and say, OK, I had all these great ideas. But is the net result that my course is going to be too long? So before I've wasted time storyboarding or building one of those, I can come back and I can, I can edit it. So it helps you. It helps to keep you from over and under designing. Helps you to track your seat time, your learner seat time, and it also overall increases your instructional effective, effectiveness. As you're doing this, I would encourage you to create some type of basic visual, even if that's just scribbling something on a post-it note, taking a picture of it and embedding it in the document. You could go so far as to wireframe it up. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples of various ways that we do it. Um, but capturing that visual really helps you know when you come back to it later. It might be weeks later that you're coming back to actually build it, but you've really captured the idea because you've already done the hard brain work. Um, there's really no right and wrong way to blueprint. It's more about the concept of knowing what you're going to do before you do it so that you can figure out if, if it's the right plan. So you may also want to include a reference to where the content's coming from, um, especially if you're synthesizing it from multiple sources. Once, and, and in the moment, while you're thinking about that activity, how long do you think it's going to take the learner to do that? And just document that too. So now you have a really good plan. Let me show you a couple examples of what a blueprint can look like. So in this particular one, we've got um, a table or a grid. And on the left-hand side, we're specifying the content. On the right-hand side, there's just a quick visual, in this case, just some stock art that paints the basic picture of what we're shooting for. We've documented the goal for this section. Then we've specified the methods that we want to use. And then in presentation, it talks about the material we're going to use and what the basic message is going to be, what people are going to be seeing and experiencing. And down below, you can see we've documented what are the key ideas and messages that this section is going to cover off on, and where are we pulling that content from. Looks like from three slides and from a handout. Off to the left, you can see that it has a five-minute estimate time. So again, no right and wrong way to do this. This is one way, but the key, the key thoughts that we've got through are there. Here's hey, Misty, one. we've got a quick question. Yeah. Um, uh, Kevin wants to know what tool is used to create the blueprint most often? You, we really just use Word. Um, we may also use PowerPoint. I'm going to show an example of that. This one was done in Word. This one was also done in Word. And this is one that looks a lot more like an outline. It doesn't contain any visuals, but it just has a textual description of what they plan to do. And that's how this designer chose to do it. Here's one that's also done in Word, and it's still in an outline format, but you can see that it has, um, it has visuals built in. In this particular case, they were taking previously designed ideas and maybe even a few PowerPoint mock-ups and just inserting those in certain places to remind themselves of the basic type of activity that they wanted to do there. And then this one is interesting because this is where somebody was blueprinting right inside their source content. So their source content was a PowerPoint, and, and that's what you kind of see on the right in the orange. And then off to the left in the blue, this is a post-it. This is just a little shape <laughs> that they started making notes in about how they want to treat this slide. And then you can see that there's a couple 
um, a couple little graphics there to capture some of their ideas. And as you look on slides two, three, and four off to the left, you can see there's additional kind of blue notes. So this person just goes right into the content and blue prints right inside. This isn't as nice to send to somebody for a sign-off, but you're not always looking for sign-off. And so if you're just trying to make notes to yourself, this is a great way to do it as well. We wanted to give you guys um, something to work with that you can massage for your needs. So Andrew is going to make this available to download, but this is just a very basic Word template that you can download and modify for what works for you. Um, but this is something to kind, of, to kind of start from that captures some of those key things that you can blueprint. Andrew, is that available for them in the panel to download? Yes, yeah, so right now in the handouts there's um there's a, a regular handout and the blueprint doc. I'm getting some reports that some people are having a hard time downloading the blueprint. Um, in it, following this webinar, I'll send an email to everybody that includes both the handout and the blueprint. So if you can't download it here, we'll get you a copy. Okay, great. Hey, so those are various examples. There are so many ways to do it, guys. But at the end of the day, do what works for you, but those are the key thoughts you want to capture and think through before you start to build. So the next and last step before you can build is to go back and, and refine. You've got your plan, and the best thing you can do now with all of, this, all of this that you've created is to go back and start asking yourself some questions and making some tweaks. So um, you're going to start by looking at your time budget. How much time did you think each of those activities were going to take, and what does that add up to overall? How's, and, and, and is your seat time too long? Is your seat time too short? How does your overall balance of activities look? Is there a variety? Are you spending too much time on your really snazzy introduction, but then not leaving enough time to practice? Should you give more time somewhere else? And as such, you might need to rethink some of your ideas. Um, were your objectives covered thoroughly? Did you miss an objective? Was, I've seen courses sometimes where there's an objective that's listed, and that concept was never even talked about during the course. Um, so this allows you to hold yourself accountable to that. And once you're done refining, the blueprint is an awesome document that you can take to a stakeholder and say, hey, I've gone through, I've conceptually treated all of your content, I want to sit down and just walk you through this conceptually and see how you feel about it. Do you feel like this is going to achieve the goals that we talked about? Are we putting the right emphasis in the right places? Because um, I'm sure we've all had the experience of getting all the way through a design and then someone comes back and says, well, this wasn't what I wanted, it's too much, it's too little, it's got the wrong focus. So the blueprint can really help with that too. So you'll make all the necessary adjustments either with yourself or and or with your stakeholder and then you're actually ready to build. Um, what's so nice about this stage is you've already done your hard work and now all you have to do is just put your headphones in and listen to your tunes and start building. Um, I used to have the hardest time before I was doing this uh, because people come interrupt you or maybe you get you can't work on it for a day and you come back and you think, what was I doing here? What was my idea? What was I going to do? All the brain work, you've done it. And all you have to do is go back and reference it and just start building it out. So it's really awesome. Um, I'm going to stop there and see what questions you guys have because we're going to move in now to talking about how to design elevated activities and we're going to go through examples and some models. But before I do, any questions about the blueprinting process in general? Yes, we've got a few questions. Uh, Donna wants to know if the blueprint is the same as story uh, storyboarding or if those are different. That is a great question. The blueprint is not the same as storyboarding. So if I were going to move into storyboarding, I would do that after this blueprint. Um, so if we look at some of these examples, um, if you're not, well, and I guess it depends on how you storyboard. You could argue that this is a storyboard. If you're in an internal training department, you usually don't have time to separately storyboard and build. So this is a great replacement for a storyboard. In our business, we would blueprint and then we would full on storyboard something before we ever build it. But most people aren't afforded that type. But we're a professional custom shop. And if you're an internal trainer, you might not have that time. So this, would, this could be a great replacement for a storyboard. Um, but we do view storyboarding to be more in-depth and complete than a blueprint. OK. Um, Cindy asks, uh, what percentage of time is used to design and blueprint versus build as a guideline? Now, that's, a great, that's another great question. Blueprinting is something that I would estimate could take a quarter to a third of your time budget. 
depending on how detailed you go and the length of your course, but it does drastically cut down on your build time because you already have a plan in place and it's already approved, and so you can really just go through all your all your hard work is done. You're not having to think and rethink and remind yourself, um, but it can take a little bit more time up front than something like an outline would. Okay. Um, another question asked by Joshua, in scenarios where you're tasked with storyboarding many different learning experiences, how would you go about ensuring blueprinting doesn't interfere with meeting tight deadlines? So I love that you ask this because this is one of the key reasons people don't plan before they build because they're on such a tight timeline. And I can tell you in the old, old days when I used to be a designer developer, my standard timeline for pushing out a course start to finish was two weeks. And so I used to just design slide by slide. And what I found out was a lot of times I ran out of time or I was having to work a lot of overtime at the end. Sometimes it wasn't what they wanted. I had one time where I came up with this really cool creative idea and the CEO hated it. <laughs> so I had to rebuild it anyway. Once I started blueprinting, it makes you a little nervous because you're not building anything. You might go three or even four days and you don't have anything built in Captivate or Storyline or Lectora. And so you're kind of panicking. But I'm telling you, if you'll just take the time, it cuts down on your development time. So really, you can accomplish the same amount of work in the same tight timeline with better results. And uh, I've had to talk people into blueprinting because they don't believe me. But if you'll just try it, um, you will find it saves you time. And you can still accomplish just as much in the same time window. OK, great. That's all the questions that we'll take now. We'll have other opportunities to take questions. Um, but let's move forward. OK. All right, so we're going to move in and talk about how to create elevated design. This is something that I'm really passionate about because if your journey has been anything like mine in the design space, you were maybe a trainer, you were maybe a subject matter expert, and someone came to you and said, we need you to start training. We need you to start creating training. And maybe that was instructor-led training. And then eventually they came and said, we need you to learn how to put stuff online, and you've just had to teach yourself. And you've, you have nothing good to look at. You have no one helping you. And so you're asking yourself, how do I do this? How do I just take content? Or how do I take an instructor-led activity and, and, and convert that online? So I found a way to try to illustrate what I do in my brain when I do this. Um, and I hope this is helpful. I'm going to walk you through kind of this conceptual model. So it's a visual representation of just the basic process I have used. And we're working left to right here by defining what our starting point is on the left, what existing content or existing experience are we working from. And then in the middle, we're boiling it down to its goal, to the, to the main objectives that it's trying to achieve. And once we've deconstructed it that way, on the right hand side, we're going to reconstruct it into a custom designed online experience. Um, something that's not a lunch lady plop, that was thoughtfully designed by a highly trained chef, which is what we are. So um, the first thing that we're looking at is maybe, I'm going to use an example of an existing classroom activity. This is one that I used to teach um, in a sexual harassment course. So as the facilitator, I would have everybody stand up and go uh, line themselves up against the wall. And I would say, okay. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read about an event that's happened in the workplace. And if you think that it's harassment, I want you to go stand on the right. And if you don't think that it's harassment, I want you to go stand on the left. If you're not sure if it's harassment, stand in the middle. And then I would start to read these events. And the participants would move left, right, or center to indicate kind of what they thought. And then after everybody was spread out, I would lead a debrief. Well, you know, does it surprise you to see that some people are standing here? Does it surprise you to see that some people are standing there? Um, who do you think is right? And then we would have a conversation about how, at least in the US, harassment is not about the um, intent that you have through whatever it was that you said or did in the workplace, but it's more about how it affected another person. And can you see, based on where everyone's standing, that everyone has a different opinion? And everyone would be affected differently by that comment or that action. And the point of this was it's to start to get people, first of all, and let's look at the goals now. So these, these, this was a goal. So you're breaking it back down. We're taking it out of the instructor-led context, and we're just looking at goals. So the goals were 
Um, and by goals, we're saying what should the learner know, feel, or be able to do as a result of whatever instructional experience we have. So in this case, we want them to know that harassment is about the effect. It's not about the intent. We also want them to know that everyone's unique perspective, background, and opinion determines how words and actions impact them. Those are key messages. But we also have an affective goal here. That's the heart. We want them to have an increased desire to modify their words and actions to limit the negative effect that they might have on others in the workplace. So once I have identified these goals, I can let go of what's here on the left. I don't need to think about that anymore. That's very distracting when I try to directly translate an instructor-led experience to online. So I'm letting go of this. I don't need it anymore because I have what I'm focusing on. Now that I have what I'm focusing on, I can reconstruct it into an online experience. And that might look something like this. We, in the online course, we might play out a workplace scenario between two characters but also show that there are onlookers to the scene. We would ask the user to identify whether or not they thought that event was harassment. We would also, before we, and, and we're not going to say anything about it, we're not going to say whether they're right or wrong, um, but we're also, then we're going to let the user explore the thoughts of, by clicking on the people of the harasser, of the person who was harassed, and also the onlookers to see their differing opinions. Once we've done that, we're going to come back and we're going to ask the user if they've changed their mind. And the narrator will come, home, come in and drive home the, the point that it's about the effect, not necessarily about the, the intent. And then at the end, we can let the user choose a revised action for the harasser that would have been more moderate or generally acceptable for the situation. So here you can see that the situation, or I'm sorry, the design or the experience we've chosen on the right looks very different than what we have on the left, but that both of them achieve these goals. In fact, I would argue um, that the right-hand side achieves it better because we go so far as to actually have them think about what would have been a more moderate action, um, which is really the desired behavior that we want to see in the, in the workplace. So this is an example of how you can use this construct. And let me back out of this. This blank template is, going, is also going to be included in the handout that we give you. Um, so you have a blank version of this for yourself. And we're going to walk through several of these together, and I want to start getting your ideas. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you pieces of content from an instructor-led training, and we're going to convert them together using this model. But before we do that, do you have any questions about how this model works? Um, let me take a look here. Um, we're getting a lot of really cool feedback. A lot of people really like uh, this this whole design with the goal in the middle and trying to figure out how to make that work. Great. Um, it's just a clunky illustration of my brain. So <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys like what my brain looks like inside. So that's good. People really like it. Um, okay, so no here's questions. a question that says, how would you handle more specific or software training and not just skills? Do you, do you treat those differently? Yeah, for software training, I probably would. Um, just because software training is pretty similar to almost how you would do it in the classroom. So I don't know that you would necessarily need to go through this whole conversion process. But what is cool about when you put software training online is you can tie it to stories and overall experiences. And so you might find value in mapping something like that out. But I don't know that you would need to use this for that. That's probably a, a good use case for something that is pretty directly translatable to the online format. OK. Um, another question is, uh, do you include the assessment phase when, when you're at this uh, part of your planning? No, probably not. Assessment would be in the, the overall blueprint. But I wouldn't necessarily, unless I was going to do something special with the assessment, I probably wouldn't go through this process for assessment. OK. Um, another one is, is it necessary to know all the information uh, right at the beginning? Or do you blueprint with some of the information and just base it off of your experience as a professional? Hmm. I think you would, if we go back to our blueprint steps, one of the first things that you do when you gather the information is also meet with subject matter experts so that you can get to a level of understanding. And actually, I really appreciate that you asked that question because it leads me to something that's pretty important. As a designer, 
if I'm not able to do this, if I can't, if I'm trying to do it and I'm just thinking, gosh, I just, I don't know what I would do. I struggled with that for years and just thought I was incompetent. And what I, what I finally realized was I don't have enough information. I don't understand this well enough to figure out how to design it. I need to go back and ask more questions of this me. What's going wrong here? Why, why don't people understand this? What do they typically do wrong? What are the impacts? Once you have that, it starts to become very clear how you can put it online. So if you're struggling, you might need to go back to a SME and better understand the content. And then to your question, over time, you can use your professional experience to fill in a lot of holes and to help with narrative and help crafting tips and stuff. But you need the basics there from the subject matter expert. Okay, um, there's a few more questions. Um, we just don't have time to get to all of these. If we do have time at the end, I'll come back to the remaining questions. Okay, great. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do some of these together. And I think it'll help you kind of better understand because I, I want you to walk away feeling like I can use this for myself. I don't need Missy anymore. I can do this for myself and really use it. So we're going to go through as many, as many examples as we have time for. Um, and we're going to start with one of the most common things we're asked to do, which is how to take instructor-led training and convert it to an online experience. We're going to look at several common areas. We're going to start with openers or introductions to courses. Um, we're going to look at how to do scenarios. We're going to look at how to do activities. And if we have time, we're going to look at how to just do presentational information as well. So let's start off with this. This is an example of an opener from an instructor-led training course on effective meeting management. What you're looking at on the left is the PowerPoint slide, and what you're looking at on the right are the facilitator notes from the facilitator guide. So you can see that the, the basic point of this from the facilitator guide is to show them all these statistics about wasted time, wasted money, wasted effectiveness in meetings, to kind of just get them thinking and then discussing as a group what do you think these figures mean? What do you think they tell us? And of course, from discussion, they're hoping that um, people come up with, gosh, you know, yeah, it wastes a lot of time and money, and we really should care uh, about the effectiveness of meetings. As you're thinking about how would I put this online, it would be very tempting to just transfer this slide into Captivate or Storyline. <laughs> just lunch lady plop that guy over. But you'll notice that in the facilitator experience, they're relying on discussion. And one of the biggest problems we have online is people don't get that. So how are they really going to reflect on this? How are they really going to get to their own opinion? We have to do something different. We can't just transfer it over. So this is where you're going to use your questions panel to contribute your ideas, so get ready. I'm going to walk through the first two columns with you, but I'm leaving the third column to you this time, and I want to hear your ideas. So on the left, the existing content or experience we have is to visually review statistics about ineffective meetings reflect on lost time, cost, and ultimately failure of ineffective meetings, and then discuss it as a group. So that's the current format. But what's the goal? The goal is that the learner will, um, through understanding the, the and being able to kind of look at the quantified impacts of ineffective meetings, that it will lead to a desire to make meetings effective and save lost time and money. So often in introductions or openers, the goals really are affective. You're trying to connect with them, to show them why they should care. And a lot of that's emotional. And so we've got to ask ourselves, well, you know, how can we have that same experience online? So that's my question to you. How do you think you could achieve these same goals? Forget about the left and just focus on the goal. How could you do that same thing through an online experience? What are your thoughts? All right, these are going to be coming in fast, so I will read them as quickly as I can. Kevin says, ask the learner what they think the numbers are, um, a two to three of those stats, and help them come... Oh, their answers are coming too fast here. <laughs> Kevin, that's a good idea. I don't know what the rest of it was, but that's a very good idea. And um, that's actually one of the tips I have, is to get people thinking and get them to guess before you tell them. It's totally okay to ask someone, like, what percentage of meetings do you think are ineffective? Or how much money do you think is wasted um, at our company or in our country every year through ineffective meetings? And get them thinking about it. Because then, once you tell them the reality, that gap and the surprise helps it hit home a lot more than when you just present something to them. So I love that idea. What else came through, Andrew? 
Laurie says, show a scenario of a company doing all the wrong things. <laughs> that would be awesome. And probably, you could probably make that funny too. And you could create a lot of things that a lot of people can connect to. I don't know if you've seen those um, YouTube videos about what a real meeting would look like if it was a webinar. And they show people appearing and disappearing from the room and their dogs barking. And um, it's really funny. You could probably do something humorous with that too that a lot of people would find very interesting and an engaging way to open. Ken says, have learner estimate each statistic, then show uh, them that statistic, then ask them to rate the significance. Oh, that's interesting. So it's, you're kind of building on what Kevin had, but then say, how much do you really think it matters? I really like that. That's cool. Um, another one, um, let's see. Ask them how to guess, ask them to guess the figures, then reveal how much time is actually wasted. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just a compare yeah. and contrast based off of their, their estimates. That's awesome. Those are great ideas, you guys. Thank you. So um, you can see how that looks a little different than what it would have been an instructor-led training. And I do have in here, just to share an idea that I had, this is an ice, just an isometric office where you've got access to a couple different rooms. These green dots would let you peek in on stuff that's happening within the office. And I mean, doesn't this sound a lot like the ideas you came up with? So um, once you click on one, you could see a little bit more. So in this situation, it says, Brent asked Yolanda to review his presentation over a working lunch meeting. He's discussing it, but she is catching up on email. What percentage of people confess to multitasking during meetings? So they can use this little slider to guess the percentage and then hit submit and get educated about what the truth is. And as they do that over here, they have a meter about wasted money and we could add a meter about wasted time um, or uh, the decrease in your reputation as a professional when you have an ineffective meeting or whatever it is. But in this case, it was wasted money. And so every time that happens, the meter goes up. And by the time they explore them all, they can see how much money is truly wasted every year through ineffective meetings. Um, so you can see as we compare the lunch lady plop of just transferring those statistics over to storyline versus what we've just created here, it is a much more elevated experience. And that's the point of this whole thing. That's the point of the conversion model is it gets you somewhere better than where you would have been with just your, your first instinct. Um, here are some tips for engaging openers. You can tell a realistic story. And you guys had this idea, right? By looking at stories from other companies who are doing it wrong. Um, but it could set the user up or set them up for a role or even let them play out or peek into the story or have something to do with what's happening. You can also use an analogy or a fable. You start out with something kind of compelling and interesting that maybe doesn't even seem related and then you come back and connect it to the point of the content. We love giving the user a role, asking for their help, asking for their opinion, asking for them to get involved in someone else's story. You can also create a villain and start off with some type of a villain role um, who may be someone who has destructive intentions and then, you know, in this case, maybe it could be somebody who's, you know, kind of a mischief mischievous meeting host or something um, and their goal is to thwart his efforts by fixing uh, people's habits in the organization. Uh, you can use an object lesson to gain their attention. This can be done just as easily in e-learning as it is in the classroom, and that's a great one that people love. You can have an illustrated concept video that talks about the what's in it for me, which is a great thing to be talking about at this stage in any course. Why do I care about this? What's in it for me? You can use very basic tools like GoAnimate or Normal for basic functions or even basic animation in your tool. The other thing that you can do, and this is, this is speaking to the affective goal of how they always want us to change how somebody feels about something, you can totally address the elephant in the room. Um, if people don't want to take your course, for example, it's some reminder about policy or it's some, you can just start out by saying, does it ever seem like a total waste of your time to have to input your task hours? Uh, uh, you know, and then they're just thinking, oh, uh, yeah, I think that all the time, but I've never said it out loud, you know, and it kind of gets their attention. Um, so the elephant in the room can be a good way to start. And then you can also put them on the spot. You guys had a several ideas that related to this, and this is an idea that we use. But ask the user for their opinion, for a decision, for a judgment on what happened, or to bet on something, or to bet on themselves, or how many of these do you think you can get right? Um, those are all great ways to get people thinking and engaged. This slide will be on your handout and all of the text that's on here. But here's a couple examples of real-life courses 
that, uh, that use those techniques. Here's one where we give the user a role. This is a compliance training, but rather than talk to them about compliance, we just put them right into the middle of a story where there's a hacker who's going to crash the U.S. stock market and we need their help and they only have an hour to identify who this person is by using personally identifiable information, which was one of the content points. Um, so it's kind of a mission impossible type of a theme. This is one where this is a search engine course, um, search engine optimization, where we just asked them um, to decide which of these companies had what percentage of the pie rather than present it to them. We asked them to think about it and drag it over there. Uh, this is a course where, this is a cust an airline customer service course where we don't start off with anything but a story. And the story is that there's been a major earthquake and all the flights are being canceled and rerouted and uh, we want them to come in and then, and then we invite them into the story, which is we need, you to help, we need you to help reroute the customers. And that becomes their task for the course. And all the information presented is to help them complete that task so they can fulfill their role in the story. Um, and this last one here is, this is a tool called Nommel, where we just created a scenario that we start out with. And this was in a kind of a communication and leadership course where we show a typical scenario and then we talk about, you know, how do you think each person felt and why do you think that is? And we use that to kind of connect before we move in uh, to the rest of the course. So, um, so that's openers. And now we're going to move on and talk about activities. How can you take an activity from instructor-led training and put that online? So we're going to start by looking at the example from the ILT. So here, um, they introduce this model called the threefold purpose of meetings. And they're saying, unless the meeting informs and allows for discussion and a decision, um, if you don't need to do all three of those things, you probably don't need to meet. You probably should be looking at doing something else. And then it comes in and says, um, email, phone calls, Skyping or instant messaging, quick in-person visits, and they want to use group discussion again to talk about when would it be more appropriate to use those methods. And then they come in and provide the answers. Here is when you should do an email instead of a meeting or an instant message or a text or when to make a personal visit. So that's the way, and I'm going to be asking for your thoughts, so get into the question panel. Um, so that's the way that the instructor-led training has it set up is basically review the threefold purpose, give a set of examples and ask the group to identify if those examples meet the threefold purpose. Um, actually, the, I feel like that was missing uh, because they really just talked about these other types of um, these other types of formats. And this is a great example of how sometimes your source content had, has missed the mark and you need to make up for it. If you're just thinking about lunch lady plopping and converting that content, you'll miss stuff like this. Um, but this allows you to fill in the holes. And then it wants them to review the appropriate communication format when meetings aren't met. So we have our goals. They need to understand the threefold purpose, identify if it's met based on a certain situation, and then also discuss or be able to explain how those other formats should be used. That's the goal. So my question to you is how would you put this online? What type of an experience can you create that would achieve that same goal online? While those ideas are coming in, Missy, a lot of people are wanting to know what that last tool was that you showed. Uh, Nomal? Nomal? Nomal. It's N-A-W-M-A-L. And it is a software, um, and that, that's the name of the company. And they design a software. It's kind of similar to GoAnimate, but they have all the characters and the environments. And it's very easy to kind of create these animated scenarios. And you can use text-to-speech, or you can record audio and put it right into this scenario. And it's just a very quick way to kind of make a little animated movie. It's a pretty cool tool, and it's fairly inexpensive. So you can check that out. All right, and uh, here's some ideas. A lot of them are very similar. A lot of people are saying to create scenarios, ask them to identify the appropriate method of communication. Um, there's another idea that says maybe a drag and drop for the type of meeting versus what you want to accomplish with feedback and summary at the end. And a, another one says, offer a game um, that you know shows a log of meetings held and and uh, making those uh, assignable to the appropriate type and content. Oh, okay, that's very creative. And all of those ideas are very focused on the instructional goal and very appropriate for online training. So that's awesome. Um, 
Here's a quick idea that I mocked up, and this illustrates a couple things that, we, that, that I'll sometimes do in my design to get away from presentational design. So here they're popped into a scenario. Great job. I was thinking the same thing. Um, Alejandro is in the process of scheduling a meeting. Can you help? And there's three steps. First, click Alejandro's computer to review his meeting purpose. So they're going to see him setting up a meeting and typing out the purpose of the meeting. So it gets them to kind of use that threefold guideline. So that's step two. Decide if his meeting purpose meets all three of the threefold guidelines. And they can click that and get a little explanation of what the threefold guideline is because they need it. Creating relevance or creating a problem for the learner is a much better way to get them to care about reading that content than to present, 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 and then ask them to use something. Sometimes, if the material is simple enough, it's okay to just throw them right in and say, if you need a lifeline, here's some more information. And then they're reading it with a purpose and they're digesting it more or retaining it more. And then step three, recommend the best communication format for his needs. So down here, they can actually select each of these icons to learn the best practice if they want. But a lot of people probably already know that. Um, so this also lets people who are more familiar breeze past, while people who are less familiar can spend more time here. Um, once they've done that, then they can choose and, and get some feedback. So very similar to what you guys were talking about. But you'll see how this feels a lot more robust and um, specifically designed for an online format than, than what we were looking at before with those PowerPoint slides. Let me um, talk about some tips, and this will be in your handout too, for engaging activities. Um, we talked about this, letting them jump right in and make a decision, but supporting them with supporting information if they need it, because they might. And it's probably not appropriate to have them jump right in when it's a complex task that they, little, they probably have very little experience with. Uh, make it fun. Sometimes it's fun just through um, the visual controls or display of the slide, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. You can also match the story, role, and task um, and bring those together in a thematic way. You can show impact, too. So, for example, depending on what he chose in this previous slide, we could show how it impacted his coworkers or what they thought of his choice if it was an important enough objective to put that extra effort in. You can also use what I call full bleed immersion with the environment, and I'll show you what this looks like. But take up the whole screen with whatever it is you're asking them to do. Make them feel like they're really in it. I also always encourage people to um, what I call approximate reality. That's what's so awesome about the online environment is you can really kind of, it doesn't have to be fancy, but you can kind of simulate and recreate an on-the-job experience, walk them through it that way. Um, design it that way and let them experience it in the same order, making the same types of decisions, having the same types of impacts as when they perform that task on the job. There's also no reason that you can't let them play a little bit or build in some Easter eggs. If, you, if you've got them working at a desk, let them turn the light off and on. Let them change the radio station. You can build in some fun things like that to help them stay engaged. And then the last thing I talk about, this is from Roger Shank, who I love. He talks about violating expectations. So anytime someone expects one thing and gets another, think about movies and stories you love. They're probably the ones that kept you guessing or had a surprise ending that you didn't expect. It catches your attention and it keeps you involved. So ask yourself, what do they expect? And then do something different. That's why that elephant in the room thing that we talked about can be so impactful because people aren't expecting you to come right out and say it um, and it catches their attention. Um, so again, these are on here. Let me show you a couple examples of what that, this is full bleed. So we're asking people to decide whether something's right or wrong by clicking the sticky notes, and then they can sort it over to legal or illegal. But this is their desk, and there's their cup of coffee. We could make it steam if we wanted to. It's just kind of fun. Um, this is an example of throwing people in and letting them use their judgment. So they're reviewing different proposals and deciding whether to approve them. And every time they do, um, they have these meters for risk, time, money, and headcount that adjust. And they might run out of money or headcount and then have to change their decisions, but they're trying to find the right balance of what they're going to approve or disapprove based on what the company's values are. This is one that's basically a click and reveal, but it feels more fun because we've used a dial from Storyline 360. So you can spin this dial around, and every time you spin it uh, to something or move it to something, it'll tell you a little bit more about that particular strategy. So nothing fancy, just feels a little bit more fun. 
This is a scenario where you have to choose the three best strategies for communication by dragging them up. Each time you drag one, she has little fireworks around her head that have different colors um, that indicate how much she liked it, and then your meter to kind of get her to be totally satisfied will go up or down a little bit. And if you don't choose all the right strategies, you can't quite get there and you have to start over. So it feels kind of gamified and keeps people involved. This is another kind of timed challenge um, where we're seeing how many they can get in a certain amount of time. This is another full bleed example where they're looking at what someone's texting or what they're actually saying and they're pointing out the problems or the statements that might be illegal. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there. That's, that's what we had time for. Your guys' ideas were great. I did have a couple more examples to go through, so let me highlight to you. The next one is scenarios. So rather than do that conversion, um, let me just show you. This is, these are some best practices for how to create meaningful scenarios. I'm currently writing a blog series on this, and we have choices and consequences out. You can find that on our blog, explanations of this. And I'm going to be writing connections soon and, and also posting out on corrections. But this is in your handout, so you can review it there. And then we also talk, we're also we going to talk about presentational content and how you can treat that. And then I just have some exam. I have, I'm sorry, right here, ideas for how to create engaging presentation of information, and that is also in your handout. So I know we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, so in summary, <laughs> don't be a lunch lady. You're a chef. Um, you add value. You can create experiences that people love and that they're willing to pay for and that they'll remember. Um, you just have to know that you are a chef and to, and to have a process and a recipe that ends up creating an end experience that people love. So I'll leave you with that and whatever, whatever questions we have time through, Andrew, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Um, one question that I'd love to take here from uh, Jamie. Uh, this goes back a little bit. When you are working on your, your plan, your blueprint, and you're making this work, uh, and if your client is not giving you clear goals, do you have suggestions on uh, how to get clarity so that you can have an effective blueprint, so you can have the information you need to make that blueprint? Yeah. A lot of times your stakeholders, especially the more senior they are, aren't going to be able to get down to objectives with you. Well, I just want people to be aware, or I just want people to, um, so you can kind of help conversationally by saying, okay, so after people take this training, what do you hope to see um, being done differently? Or how do you hope it impacts the business? Don't ask about it in the form of objectives. Ask about it in a way that they'll be able to speak to, and then you can kind of reconvert it into an objective. But if that's not working, you could also go so far as to just kind of quickly what we call wireframe, which is where you're just kind of using boxes on a screen to start mocking up a couple of the key experiences that you think people are going to have in this course and then go back and show them that visually and talk them through it and get a sense for if they think that's right or wrong and that might lead to some additional discussion that gets them talking about um, what the object, oh no, 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 I just want them to this, you know, and sometimes people need to see something and react to something to then give you those additional thoughts. Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of people, since we didn't get through the, the full slide deck, um, we, we will make the deck available for you guys to, to glance through as well. You're going to have a copy of this webinar to review and watch um, as you like, so uh, hopefully that answers some of those questions. That's all the questions that we have. Uh, time for today. Um, do you have one more slide for me, Misty? I do. Um, what I want to talk about really quickly for all of you, I, I, there was a call, a request for uh, more links to various online courses or examples. Here on this slide in the middle section, uh, you can get a custom development demo, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include a link where you can sign up for one of those in the email that you'll get following this webinar. Um, also, we've got loads of templates. Some of the stuff that Misty showed in there, um, you can get pieces of those in templates so that it's faster for you to build those out, and you can get access to those by calling the number on the screen there at the top um, or just sending an email to get more information and support at elearningbrothers.com. Also, um, Misty, people love you. I'm just looking at these comments. They absolutely love this. You're, you're amazing. You're, you're obviously an expert. We have tons of experts here at eLearning Brothers. We are constantly making amazing content for our clients and offering templates so that you too can become an e-learning rock star. But if you want more 
one-on-one uh, -on -one time with some of our professional developers. Uh, you can sign up for that professional development packet, it, package. It's there um, at the bottom. Uh, it says you can go to elearningbrothers.com slash professional development or just go to elearningbrothers.com and find professional development in the, uh, the top bar there and you'll be able to, to grab what you need there. Um, so for sure, come to our website, look for our email. I'll, I'll include links to all of these places. I'll also include the handouts, the blueprint, a uh, copy of this webinar, everything that you'll ever need. So again, thank you so much, Misty. This has been great. Everybody loves you. Everybody loves this great content. Um, we look forward to, to hearing from you again in the future. Misty writes blogs for us. You can look at our, our blog as well for, for more information and more ideas. Um, if you want to learn more about more. blueprinting and storyboarding, I'll be doing a full pre-conference workshop before DevLearn in October. So sign up, come see me. We're going to spend eight hours talking about this. Yep, it's going to be great. Um, again, if you're interested, reach out to us and I'll, I'll get you this email. Thank you so much, Misty, and thanks everybody for attending. We hope to see you next time. Thanks, everyone.